So by participating in the support group calls, you are acknowledging you understand there are no mental health providers or attorneys on this call and that nothing said here is any way to be interpreted as mental health counseling or legal advice. Dr. Coleman has a huge two pages of his background. He's a psychologist in private practice in San Francisco, a senior fellow with the Council on Contemporary Families, a nonpartisan organization of leading sociologists, historians, psychologists, and dem demographers dedicated to providing the press and public with the latest research and best practices. He also has a book he published last year. I highly recommend you get it. Um, you can get it on his website. He also does talks on, I believe, Monday. I'm not sure if it's Monday or Tuesday. I'll let you clarify that. Um, that you can all get on highly recommended. He will answer your questions and those are complimentary. So if you want to get some personal insight, um, do sign up for those calls and get on his mailing list. So with that, Dr. Coleman, I'm going to turn the meeting over to you. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Good to get you on the call and good to, um, to be involved with ISNAF. We've been kind of doing things together for quite a few years. And I really like the organization and Cindy, and I think they, they're very dedicated to helping uh, estranged and alienated families. So um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, and just in terms of what I do, I'm a psychologist in private practice, but also write, I do have a Tuesday night uh, webinar, but I have a free every other uh, Monday Q&A that you can uh, get through my newsletter, which is also free, which you can get through my website. And I usually send out four or more uh, articles um, a week about estrangement or alienation. And, um, you know, people find those helpful. I also have a free uh, Facebook, private Facebook group for estranged and alienated parents and grandparents, which you can also I access through my website. I've got um, 4,500 people on that currently. Uh, and my mailing list of estranged and alienated parents is currently at like 11,000 people. So there's a lot of people out there who are, who are struggling with this. And what I often say to parents is that I think that it's sometimes therapeutic just to be on calls like this to see and hear how many other people uh, are going through this. So for example, I have a free webinar coming up and then I'll stop with all my housekeeping issues, but I have a free webinar coming up a week from Tuesday called Should I Keep Trying or Just Give Up? And I've already got 400 people registered for that and it'll probably go up to, to five or 600. So you're not alone. There's tons of people struggling with this. So to get into the meat of tonight's topic, the issue is, is my child's therapist part of the problem? And I have a whole chapter on that in my book and I have a whole webinar on it because I commonly see that people's therapists are uh, commonly the problem. And one of the ways to think about this is historically that um, therapy, say prior to the 1960s, wasn't so oriented towards change and, re you know, rejecting your parents and, um, you know, using them as a platform of personal growth and the like, but really beginning in the 60s and continuing very much to this day, uh, parents are viewed as being an obstacle to happiness and personal growth. And the attitude is almost something like lose your parent, find yourself. That we've gone from a culture where of honor thy mother and thy father, respect thy elders, family is forever, to a culture where the moral framework is, does this relationship make me happy or does it not make me happy? If it doesn't make me happy, then that person is toxic uh, or a problem and I don't owe them anything. And not only can I cut them out of my life because I've got support from my parents or my online forums or Reddit or whatever, uh, but I should. In fact, cutting people out of your life is an example of being an assertive person with lots of boundaries and knowing yourself and it's tied to one's identity. So the problem with therapy and therapists is that we don't really exist outside the common culture. Therapists are part and parcel of the our highly individualistic culture, which is by individualism, we mean that it's an orientation towards the self, 
towards autonomy, towards separation, towards individuation. Uh, and we're really more like what the um, the Dutch, uh, Dutch American sociologist Amy Schallert refers to as adversarial individualists, meaning that we achieve our feelings of being individuals by pushing apart, uh, pushing away from our parents, where it's adversarial in that way, starting in adolescence, typically around drugs or sex or whatever, but, but often in young adulthood as well, sort of finding oneself, one's voice, etc., by defying the parent. And whereas a religion used to tell people who to keep in their lives and uh, who to be close to, et cetera, increasingly today, it's therapists. Therapists have become the high priests, the ones who tell us who's toxic and who's not, who's crossing your boundaries, who you should keep in your life and who you should kick out of your life. And to that effort, uh, one of the things that therapists are engaged in is what the sociologist Allison Pew uh, refers to as we become kind of detachment brokers, meaning that we're helping people detach from their families uh, without feeling like feelings of guilt or responsibility. So I commonly hear adult children, you may have heard it already from yours, say things like, well, I don't owe you anything, or you made these mistakes in the past, so um, I don't have to have a relationship with you. So therapists in many ways are kind of confirming those instincts and those biases. We're very oriented towards removing guilt or putting the label on it as being something that's an example of codependence uh, and or labeling the, the parent as a narcissist or a borderline or a sociopath or a gaslighter or a boundary crosser or, or whatever it is. But the idea is that the individual, the client, your child, uh, is, uh, isn't is supposed to feel really any feeling of obligation for the parent. This isn't true in all cultures, even in the US. It tends to be generally less true in Latin American cultures, less true in Asian American cultures, in African American cultures. But if your lineage is Euro-American, then the chances that your child feels that way towards you and expresses that towards you is very, very high. Now, what's the problem with this orientation when therapists jump in the mix? Well, there's um, there's the idea that um, once therapists start blaming parents for the children having the issues that they have, uh, then you're on a very rapid path towards a, an estrangement or an alienation. Now, for the purposes of my talk, I'm just going to use the word estrangement um, I don't use it in the, quite the same way that people who lecture about alienation use it. For them, alienation is, you know, with an other parent, um, poisons a child against the parent, which I use also. But they often use estrangement as what I would call justifiable estrangement. I personally think that's confusing because those of us who do research in sociology and psychology use estrangement in the more general way, which just refers to a general cutoff uh, or ending of relationships with people. So I would use justifiable uh, estrangement rather than just estrangement. So for the purposes of our talk tonight, um, I'll be using the word estrangement in that more general way of which alienation is a subset um, of that. So either way, the, when a therapist gets involved in that, in that way, they're inviting a position of contempt and anger towards the parent. They're also encouraging a victimized stance uh, that the adult child has towards the parent. Well, you hurt me in this way. You didn't see that I was depressed. You were mean to my mom or my dad or whatever. So I don't need you in my life. And, you know, and cutting the parent out of the life is considered not only a good thing to do, but a reasonable thing to do. Now, the bigger problem with this is what sociologist Eva Elouz summarizes when she says, today everybody's lives are plotted backwards. What's a dysfunctional family? It's a family where your needs weren't met. How do you know your needs weren't met? By looking at your present condition. And the reason that I think that that's such an insightful statement is that it really summarizes our moment today where people are being led to assume, quite wrongly, 
that the reason that they have the issues that they have, their depression, their anxiety, their failure to launch, uh, their issues with relationships, with money, with intimacy, with commitment, etc. Well, all people have to do is just dial back and find out what their hidden traumas were. Now, you know, traumas are a real thing. Uh, there are, you know, pe lots of people are really hurt uh, by their by their parents in childhood. But the idea that those become repressed and can later be brought out later in life is a complete myth. There's no evidence to, to show that. In fact, memory does not work like a videotape uh, the way a lot of therapists uh, believe that it does. And enormous harm is being done that. I'm, I'm working more and more with parents who are willing to go undergo a lie detector test or a psychiatric battery of tests or evaluation because their adult child is now saying, well, you know, I took psilocybin and had a memory of you molesting me, or I did EMDR or hypnotherapy, uh, and I now realize that you molested me. Now, I'll always take those accusations seriously. And by that, I don't mean I assume that the child is always right, though. It means I assume that, that it has to be investigated and taken seriously. But it doesn't mean that every accusation, every memory that an adult child has, no matter what, has to be treated as factual. The problem is that many therapists are not familiar with the science around memory, don't realize that uh, somebody can can all of a sudden have a memory that isn't really a memory, and that many therapists who assume hidden traumas uh, are at the heart of every psychiatric issue, uh, which is very common in today's culture with books like Body Keeps the Score or some of these other books. There's the assumption that everybody's been traumatized and everybody's functioning as a result of their traumas. And it's their traumas that are causing everything that, um, you know, all the problems that they're having. Well, sometimes that's true, but even people who are deeply traumatized, um, you know, there's only a 10 to 25% chance that they're gonna have post-traumatic stress, meaning that it's gonna have a lifelong effect or impact on them. They may have distressing memories when they think about it, but that's very different from today's construction of reality, which argues that if you had a painful experience, a, then it's going to have a lifelong effect on you, or B, if you don't have any memories, well, those, those problematic traumas are in there, you just have to uncover them. But the problem even still with that is that once you do uncover them, well, then you're on a slippery slope to rejecting the parent, because then you're on this moral pathway to saying, well, you hurt me, so I don't owe you anything. In fact, it's being, being strong or being assertive or being strong. Um, you know, behaving in, a, in a, a powerful way to cut out the parent. So, um, so this is a serious problem in our in our society, and it's it's causing a huge amount of estrangement. Now, I highlight this because parents are somewhat important, but you know, sometimes they're not as important as genetics in terms of outcome, whether or not you have depression or anxiety or mental illness. Social class is enormous. That growing up in adverse circumstances where you're growing up in, in poverty, in a terrible, violent neighborhood, uh, may be a far better predictor of how you turn out rather than how your parents treat or did or didn't treat you. And also poverty itself may cause the parents to treat you in ways that they certainly wouldn't want to wish for their child or for anybody else. Neighborhood is also hugely important. Recent research showed that when poor kids are uh, move into a really good neighborhood, suddenly their life trajectory chances greatly improve because of the social capital of the other middle and upper class kids that are living there and their families are living there. So this idea that everything is parents is highly problematic. Social class is hugely important. Siblings are hugely important in how children turn out. Peer group is enormously important in terms of how children turn out. You know what else is important? Bad luck and good luck are hugely important. The randomness of life. 
Um, so I think so many parents today are really confused because most of the parents that I work with actually provided their child with a far better life than anybody ever provided for them, you know, both financially and psychologically. They've done their own therapy. Maybe they sent their kids to therapy. Maybe they paid for their college. You know, they may have even given them a down payment on the house. And now they're being told that they emotionally abused and they neglected and they harmed and they hurt their child. Now, in some ways, parents and adult children are talking past each other. And this has to do with um, psychologist Nick Haslam's article about what he calls concept creep. And concept creep is what Haslam found was that over the past three and a half decades, we've enormously expanded uh, what we consider to be hurtful, harmful, uh, um, neglectful, or traumatizing behavior. So often parents and adult children are talking past each other because the adult children have been raised in a culture where they're being led to believe that certain kinds of experiences are evidence of trauma and harm, etc. And the parents are saying, that's harm? That's emotional abuse? You should have seen what I grew up with. You know, particularly for those parents who raised their children uh, in a way that was far better than anybody ever raised them. So, you know, as a therapist, as a psychologist in practice for 40 years plus, um, I'll certainly ask about people's childhood. Part of our, you know, we all know from our own childhoods that it is a part of who we are. It's not trivial. It's just not as important as my field is making it out to be. And it's not only my field, it's all of the other self-help that's out there. There's TikTok, there's Instagram, there's all these influencers who don't know shit, and yet they're ruining lives by talking about 10 signs, your mom's a narcissist, five reasons to cut off your parent, etc. And they're basing it on this kind of a phony, ridiculous, stupid psychology that has absolutely no basis in science. Now, Again, that doesn't mean that childhood isn't important, but we have to distinguish between distressing feelings and traumatizing feelings and experiences that actually have long-term causality and implications. Because it's on that basis that so many parents are being cut off from their children today. Now, why why is the issue of shame of of trauma become so so popular? Why is it so common now? Well, more importantly, I can recommend three great books that basically are much more hopeful, that, much, that say much more from serious scientists, researchers, that are far more likely to talk about resilience as the uh, what, what's really true about nature, not that we're all walking around with traumas that are running our, our lives, work by George Bonanno at, at Columbia, or uh, Dr. Paris in, in Toronto, or there's an, another person whose name I can't, uh, can't recall. But there's a number of people doing really interesting, fascinating research, and they all come to the same conclusion about trauma, which is that the message about trauma isn't its lifelong effect on most people. It's, it's that even people who experience serious traumas, most of them turn out just fine. And in some many cases actually have do better because they're sort of forced, forced to dig deeper. So why, why isn't that the news? Why aren't those books on the bestsellers list? Because trust me, they're not. I mean, some of the best books, you know, like Paris's book, Myths of Childhood, Myths of Trauma, I mean, you know, look at their Amazon reading. They're like a million and 70 or something. George Bonanno's book at Columbia. I mean, I don't look lately, but last time I looked, it wasn't selling particularly well. Yet books like Body Keeps the Score and some of these other books that assume everybody's traumatized and everybody's running around being influenced by their trauma, they're massive bestsellers. Well, why, why is that? Well, part of the reason is that we live in a highly meritocratic culture, which means that you're supposed to, you know, if you don't do well in life, if you grow up with depression or anxiety or come into adulthood with depression or anxiety or any of these other issues, well, you have nobody to blame but yourself. So what is, why does trauma provide for you? Well, trauma basically is a way of saying, well, that explains why I'm not who I want to be. If I hadn't been traumatized, I'd be a totally different person. Now, as I said, Sometimes that's true, 
but more often it's not true because who we are has more to do, generally speaking, with genetics, with social class, with neighborhood, with random good luck, with random bad luck, with peer group, with siblings, etc. So all of those things shape who we are, not so much our traumas, at least not for the vast majority of people. And it's the vast majority of people who are walking around assuming that they're being traumatized and worse, cutting off their parents. So the reason the trauma narratives are so powerful is because of their enormous defense against feelings of shame and inadequacy. Second of all, it kind of inspires hope. I mean, resilience should inspire hope. But if you believe that you're, you could have had a very different life with very different parents, I mean, in some ways, that could be kind of a hopeful sounding message because it's a way to say, well, it's not my fault. I have these issues. It's the fault of mom and dad. Now, worse is that if it's mom and dad's fault, then if I cut them out, it's like I'm ex excising, you know, I'm cutting out a cancer in my body. I'm removing a tumor. And that's partly why so many of these adult children have so many discussions about boundaries and limit setting with their parents. There's a bunch of other reasons why they do valid reasons. But, but in this particular space, a lot of adult children have this idea that in setting limits on the parent and having boundaries with them in cutting off contact with them, which is certainly the biggest boundary you can possibly have that somehow they're insulating themselves which with what they believe to be the toxic, corruptive, coercive forces uh, in their um, in their psychology. Now, to continue, so let's look at Gen Z. Gen Z are those kids that are born um, after 1995. Um, so that population is struggling enormously. They have really high rates of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and suicide, uh, actually take, committing suicide. It's incredibly tragic. Um, but a certain percentage of those adult children once they're adults, actually, some of them aren't yet, but it, once they're adults are going to end up in therapy with a therapist who assumes, who doesn't know anything about this research, and is going to assume that, well, you have depression or anxiety, uh, or you've been suicidal, well, let's figure out what your traumas are. And they'll find something in the child's history. And if they don't find it, they'll assume that they're in there and they start digging around. And once a the therapist starts digging around, well, memories find a way to, to begin to surface. And some therapists, particularly those who believe that everybody's been sexually abused, who has a, who's dysfunctional in adulthood, will make suggestions. They'll say things like, well, this week, why don't you go home and see if anything comes up? Pay attention to your dreams. See if you have any sensations in your body. Well, that's just incredible suggestion. I mean, the research from Elizabeth Loftus uh, who's considered one of the top scientists by Time Magazine, found that suggest people can really be led to believe almost anything uh, if the suggestions are subtle enough and, and common enough. And that's a lot of what's happening to these, these children um, today, you know, both minors, but also adult children. They're getting into therapy with people who are convincing them that the source of their issues are their parents, A, and B, that cutting off their parent is an act of being assertive and solidifying their identity and developing their self-esteem and their confidence. You know, we have an incredible, not just Gen Z, but we have an incredible issue of loneliness in this culture, of depression, of anxiety, of social isolation and atomization. And, you know, partly it's therapy as far as I'm concerned, and I'm a therapist, but it's partly because we're not really helping people. We have a great rich language about separation, individuation, boundaries, limit setting. We don't have a particularly great language about interdependency, about compassion, about empathy. Those are considered acts of codependence. And the idea that children owe their parents something, which they do, is also considered somehow antithetical to what being, you know, a good, solid, assertive uh, adult adult is to these days. So, you know, um, so that this is an incredible, incredibly important part, and so many parents are being uh, cut off from their childhood, from their children today, and their grandchildren. 
Now, the reality is that parents do the best they could, and that matters when they were raising their children. And how they parented, even if they made enormous mistakes, they may have made them because of who they were married to at the time, or their current relationship to their ex, if there was a divorce, and they have been victims of parental alienation, their economic security while they were raising children, their support or lack thereof from their community or family or friends, the child's psychological, temperamental, or learning issue. See, that's the other thing that's really problematic about our moment today is that um, the four, there's a 40% um, influence in terms of how our personalities become. These are called the big five factors in personality, and they're genetically loaded. So the way to remember this is through the acronym OCEAN, O-C-E-A-N. Uh, it's, and any of you who have more than one children know that genetics are really powerful and who your kids are. I have twins and a daughter from a first marriage, so I've seen how different all three of them are. In some ways, my fraternal twins are more different than, you know, one of my twins is with my, my daughter. Um, but OCEAN is openness to experience. The C stands for conscientiousness. The E stands for extroversion. The A stands for agreeableness. And the N stands for neuroticism. Neuroticism is worry, guilt, pessimism, negativity. Now, each one of those factors exists on a continuum. So agreeables, agreeableness goes to disagreeableness. Conscientiousness goes to sociopathy or something like that. Extroversion is on the continuum with introversion. Neuroticism probably goes with something like uh, resilience or optimism would be would be my guess. But these are important because kids, for example, who are born with uh, a, more, a more oppositional style, who are more negative, who are more rebellious, who are more defiant, these are all genetically loaded uh, characteristics, who have cold callousnesses, which is so associated with antisocial personality, all of those things cause parents to behave in a certain way. So when people are showing up to therapy, most therapists aren't saying, well, let's look at, you know, let's like examine your childhood and see, make a determination of kind of what your nature is, kind of how you might have come into the world. I mean, a really good therapist might do that. Um, but a lot of therapists will just assume wrongly, stupidly, that every personality attribute comes from parenting behavior. Oh, you were oppositional? Well, that's because your parents were making the mistakes and, you know, you were just defying them because they were too critical or rejecting, you know, or negative. Oh, you were, you were anxious, socially anxious? Well, maybe because your parents were, were too critical or, or whatever. I'm just highlighting that if you don't have, as therapists, a broader orientation to causality, to what causes outcome, to what causes um, adult functioning, dysfunction, psychopathology, failure, etc. You're gonna assume that everything is mom and dad. And once you assume that as a therapist, you're the high priest. You're the one who's saying, get rid of them, cut them out, go no contact. It's really good for you. You need to work on being more assertive, on setting boundaries, on setting limits, on cutting off these toxic people, these parents, and it's considered an, an act of, of psychological health rather than retreat. There's no courage in cutting off a parent, especially the people in my practice and all of you, I bet, who are willing to do the work, who are willing to, to repair, to make amends, to hear the child out, to work on the relationship, to go to family therapy, to work, do in the, their own individual therapy. I'm not giving parents a pass here. You know, my, my, my whole methodology, sometimes parents don't like it, but it is you have to start from a position of finding the kernel of truth in your child's complaints. Even if you don't think there's one, you still have to find that. You still have to show compassion and empathy for them and take the high road and not get pulled into the weeds. This goes to what I call the five most 
common mistakes of a strange path. The first common mistake is to think it should be fair. What's well, not fair? You have to be strategic. The second common mistake is to think that guilt's going to get you anywhere. Well, no, guilt won't get you anywhere. That ship has sailed. Maybe it would have for our parents, but that doesn't work anymore. The third is to return fire with fire, to imagine that if you're as aggressive as your kid is, that's going to bring them to the bargaining table. Nah, it won't. The fourth is uh, not knowing that estrangement, assuming estrangement, once you've done a few correct things, that um, it's going to be a sprint to the finish line. No, it's probably going to be a marathon. Once a kid has cut off contact, it may be months, if not years, before we can bring them back to the fold. The fifth is assuming that all of their distance, etc., is about us. Now, often their distance, it might be, but it may also be that they're they're just involved with their own lives, their, their own children or marriage or divorce or their friends or their social group or launching their careers or et cetera. So all those behaviors are going to in fact how, impact um, how, we, how we communicate and whether or not our children uh, want to communicate with us. But I'm highlighting the child's issues because we rarely hear about that as in terms of affecting how the parent responds. We only hear about good parents and bad parents. You know, should you estrange your, your parent or shouldn't you estrange your parent? And there's not nearly enough discussion in our culture about, um, about what we call child to parent effects, how certain children actually cause the parent to behave in a certain way. And it's certainly true once a kid becomes alienated. Um, you know, then parents, you know, are going to probably make mistakes because they're just freaking out. They're terrified. Their children are spouting things that they know they didn't do. They're being accused of abuse or neglect or harm that they know that there's their ex put in the child's mouth. So that's terrifying to parents. But, you know, once we're terrified as a parent, we don't always respond in the healthiest way. Often we respond defensively or aggressively or avoidantly, and none of those things are going to uh, going to work if our goal is to um, move things towards reconciliation. So, so what about um, when your child tells you, "Well, my therapist said you're a narcissist or you're a borderline." Well, in general, um, the temptation is to you know say that you're going to report that person to the board of psychology or whoever the licensing board is um you know or just defend yourself or deny it or tell them that you've been in therapy for 30 years and nobody's ever accused you of that so they're probably full of crap but don't do that you're far better off um trying to find the kernel of truth which is key to my whole methodology and the kernel of truth approach is to say something like well um i haven't thought about myself in that way before um, but maybe you're right. Maybe I am a narcissist. Is there something in particular that you'd like to read me to, me to read? Are there particular memories that give you that feeling? Uh, is it something uh, uh, that I am currently doing or things that I've done in the past? In other words, show due diligence. Now, this is important because one of the ways that generations are different from each other is that younger generations are very oriented towards um, psychological health, and then protection of mental health, growth, egalitarian communication, etc. So when you do that, you're actually engaging in that kind of communication. You're showing that you're willing to look at yourself, that you're not being defensive, that you're not going to just uh, push away the child, that you're not going to, you know, just ridicule them, criticize them, as tempting as that may, may be. So um, more importantly, you want to get them to say what the behaviors are that makes them feel like you're a narcissist or a borderline or a gaslighter or whatever you're being accused of. Because that builds in accountability. You know, whether you are or aren't a narcissist isn't really something you can work on, particularly because there's this common misconception that if somebody's a narcissist, a, they don't feel anything, and B, they're hopeless and helpless to change. It's not true, but that's the way people, that's the belief people have. So you're far better off getting them to list the behaviors that are problematic. So, and saying, so what are the things that 
I do that bother you? Will you let me know the next time I do them? Can we do family therapy so that we can work on this? No, my therapist says you're hopeless. Well, maybe I am. I don't know. But I think, uh, um, you know, if we could maybe do a few sessions of family therapy around it, maybe there's more hope here than, than meets the eye. So part of the reason that so many parents are being, moms in particular, are being called narcissists today is the way that parenting has changed in the past, um, you know, 40 years, 40 to 50 years or so. We've become much more intensive as parents, much more anxious, much more guilt-ridden, much more involved. We're spending far more time with our children than prior generations did, even including uh, career mothers still spend more time with their children than uh, stay-at-home moms did in the 1960s. And one of the reasons that so many of these children talk about wanting boundaries is because they um, they feel like there's been too much influence on the parents' side. I've worked with more than one uh, adult estranged daughter who said something like, you know, I just need to get my mother's voice out of my head, and I don't know any other way to do it. So a certain percentage of estrangements occur because the child doesn't know any other way to feel separate from the parent. Now, they may be saying it's because the parent is a borderline or a narcissist or they're, you have some kind of painful childhood memory that proves the parent's malfeasance, but often it's because in some ways they were too close. Now, I know a lot of you had very close relationships with your adult child before, before they went no contact. So often that can be the case. Another influence is social media. If you have the uh, misfortune to wander onto one of the estranged adult children's sites, first of all, they love me on those sites. Just kidding. No, they don't. Uh, but if you <laughs> happen to go on one of those sites, you'll see, if, you know, kind of a rabid antagonism towards parents and anything that defends the parents' perspective is considered just, you know, enabling their terrible traumatizing behavior. So social media and forums and Instagram and TikTok have all become this way of providing a kind of social social support and social contagion, I would argue, for people feeling like this is a good, valuable, uh, reasonable thing to do. And the other problem with therapists is that most of them don't really think through the long term ramifications of what they're encouraging. You know, they're often more like divorce attorneys thinking what's in the best interest of the client who's sitting in the room with them, not thinking about, well, how is this going to affect the grandparents or the grandchildren or the next generation? And I think that's a big problem in the way that we conduct therapy today. So what can you do if you think that the therapist is the problem? And I'm probably going to go for another 10 minutes or so, and then we'll, we can do a half hour Q&A or so. So what parents can do is if you're writing uh, a letter or an email or texting your adult child and you think they're in therapy, you need to be communicating in a really good, clear way in the way that I've been describing today. You need to be communicating empathically, compassionately, taking responsibility, because in all likelihood, if your child's in therapy, they're going to be reading it to their therapist and they're going to be commenting on it. So avoid language that's overly blaming, critical, defensive, etc. Take responsibility for the mistakes that you've made. If you don't understand, tell the child that you don't understand, but you want to, that it's clear that you have blind spots, that you don't have a better understanding, uh, express willingness to do family therapy. Now, some adult children will only meet with the parent if they're willing to meet with the child's therapist. Now, if that's the only way you can get uh, your child to meet with you, uh, then you probably should do it, but it has its risks. One is that if your child's therapist has been hearing how terrible you are for these years, uh, they may already be prejudiced against you. The other is that, you know, the ch your child's therapist doesn't have your back. They have your child's back. So if push comes to shove, they're going to support your child um, over you. So if that's the case, then uh, you... Um, it, it, but if you still feel like you need to meet with their, uh, their therapist, here's what I recommend. Um, when in doubt, just listen. You're better off saying too little than saying too much. 
Uh, B, think about it as it's not marriage therapy where you get an equal say over how things have been for you and what you like like the relationship to be. In all likelihood, it's more like you you know a divorce where the person's willing to give that person a second chance, but they've got all the power and it's going to be on their terms. So you're there to learn how to communicate with your adult child and to understand what he or she needs for going forward. Empathize with the kernels of truth. If something is completely at odds with your memory, and it may well be, particularly if you're an alienated parent, ask your child what's important to them about that memory. Ask for help from the therapist in terms of the best way to address it if you find yourself feeling defensive. Don't assume your complaints will be equally addressed. If you feel ganged up on, just try to listen. Again, when in doubt, saying too little is better uh, than saying too much. If your child has a um, false memory, um, try to avoid getting cornered. You can say, well, I don't really recall it that way, but let, you know, I'd like to have some more time to think about it um, and you know, promise to get back to you next week, et cetera. So, um, you know, with parental alienation, there's enormous problems with therapists that typically happen when the children with, are younger. Uh, and that is when they get co-opted by one of the parents or their attorney, and the therapist filters everything that they hear through that narrative, rather than assuming that both parents have legitimate perspectives. They may fail to identify the psychological or forensic signs of an intractable family, uh, such as when a parent refuses to transport the child to the other parent's house, or showing up late for reconciliation therapy, or not attending at all. Uh, if the therapist fails to get a mandate from the court that the goal is to heal the relationship between the parent and the child, where the therapist is unwilling to report to the court how one parent is blocking progress, such as refusing to take the child to reconciliation th therapy, reconciliation therapy, or undermining the therapeutic process, uh, or where the therapist is convinced that the other parent, the alienated parent, is beyond redemption rather than somebody who just needs help. Uh, finally, when the therapist doesn't understand that process uh, and progress needs to be conducted with speed, uh, urgency, and um, um, you know, speed and urgency, because particularly when children are younger, time is running out. And once children are adults, it is harder to influence in alienated children, particularly if you don't have any kind of power. So common mistakes that parents make is that hopefully I'm illustrated or blaming the parent, uh, but they can also make the mistake of not helping the parent acknowledge the legitimate complaints of the adult child. Uh, I think a lot of parents uh, overly encourage the the parent to be assertive and to push back and to set limits. It's typically a bad idea because by the time an adult child isn't talking to a parent, then uh, nothing's going to compel them to come back to the parent beyond whether or not they want to. So the parent has to has to communicate in a way that makes that feel uh, appealing. Another common mistake of therapists is not seeing the power of an amends letter might be to bring the child to the table. Another common mistake is being too reassuring. I hear a lot of therapists saying things like, well, they'll come back, or you were a good parent, or they're gonna figure out that they were alienated. Well, guess what, they might not, you know? And so we don't really help our uh, clients when we're being too reassuring. It's far better to help them to radically accept where they are now and to have one foot in hope, but the other foot in radical acceptance, which is basically that maybe they, things won't get better because, mal, you know, um, naive hope isn't really very useful for uh, anybody. Um, so I could go on and on, as you could imagine, uh, but let me stop here and um, take your questions, and then we will go from there. So Cindy, okay. <laughs> let me go to the top here. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. That was excellent. Good, thanks. So we have um, uh, an alienated 18-year-old who does not respond to texts or emails. She returned last year, then left at graduation, um, and she's trying to get a ticket to the graduation. How 
to break through? How could she break through? So this is a mother who's trying to get a ticket to the graduation? Correct. And the daughter came home for a short period of time after, say, two years of alienation, court battle. The daughter came home for briefly for a couple of months. I know this case. That's why I can speak about it. And yeah. so now, and then the daughter left as soon as she turned 18. Now graduation is coming. coming. So what can she do to try to break through? Um, well, when graduations are coming, I sort of like parents to kind of, if a kid isn't communicating at all, I will sometimes encourage parents to write a letter that says, I mean, first of all, you know, I think we should always start with some kind of an amends letter. Now, I think these letters are super hard when parents are targets of alienation because part of the, re nobody wants to make amends for things they didn't do, right? But what I commonly tell parents to do is to, if you can't find the kernel of truth, then, you know, if your kid says something like, well, you were always so critical growing up and you know that you weren't critical, maybe you were critical once or twice, but you know that your spouse uh, labeled you that way or that, you know, that they thought you were critical of them or whatever. Um, you know, once a kid believes they've been brainwashed and alienated, they believe it. It's there as a memory. And, you know, I would, you know, just talked about how easy it is to distort and implant memories. So these kids actually believe what it is that they're they're telling you. So you're never, ever going to get anywhere, you know, by um, saying, no, that didn't happen. No, you're wrong. You're you know, you're a victim of parental alienation. Never tell your child you're a victim of parental, they're a victim of parental alienation. It just makes it seem like you're not willing to take responsibility. You're far better off assuming that there's some kernel of truth to it. So let's say your kid says, um, well, you were always so critical. You could say, well, um, you know, thanks for giving me that that feedback. It's clear that I had blind spots that I wasn't aware that um, I was communicating in that way, but I'm glad you told me. And uh, I'm wondering if you feel comfortable telling me other memories that you have that make it hard for you to be uh, in contact with me. Or um, maybe we could get into therapy and, and talk about that or how some of that has impacted you. In other words, you have to go all the way toward it. You can't like kind of say, well, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. In saying it's clear that I have blind spots, it's kind of saying, well, who knows? Maybe you're right, you know, uh, without sounding flippant. Now, in the case of a kid with a graduation, you know, whether it's high school or college or something else, if the kid's not isn't communicating. I typically tell parents, tell parents to say something like, well, you know, it's always been my plan and assumption that I would be at your graduation. So unless you tell me that you absolutely don't want me there. I'm planning on showing up. Now, if you don't want me to come up to you, I won't, but it is my plan um, to be there. Now, that typically will evoke something from the uh, the child, either no, don't come, um, or, but if they don't respond, then you've kind of given yourself cover. As a rule, you know, I don't typically recommend that parents just show up to these events as completely ridiculous and unfair, you know, as it is particularly a parent who's been alienated and was a good, decent parent, and there's nothing about, you know, they're showing up that is remotely fair. It's really, you know, it's really hurtful to them to feel like they can't go to these things, but it can tends to make matters worse. So sometimes parents have to just um, put the willingness to accept the child's um, limits um, in the bank, meaning that, you know, they can kind of the parent, the child can feel like, OK, well, you accepted that limit. You know, I can relax some. Otherwise, if the child doesn't feel that way, then they can just they might escalate things. That's sometimes why some of these kids go even more underground. They cut off texting or um, um, et cetera. So that would be how I would address that issue. Okay, thank you. Now that leads me to a question, um, another question I'm just gonna ask. So what happens because the child will tell you, I don't want you to come to my graduation. And then their response is, why can't you respect my boundaries? Um, and they're basically telling you to get out of their life. What do you do with that? Uh, I think you, you still have to kind of push back on that, and sit, but you have to keep it, you know, calm. And, you know, what do we want to say when kids say that? We want to say something like, you little selfish brat, after everything that I've done for you, you know, it isn't just a matter of my respecting your, 
your boundaries. You wouldn't be where you are today if it wasn't for me. I mean, that's what most parents feel and think realistically. But that's not going to get you anywhere uh, with your kid. You could say, well, um, I am willing to respect your boundaries, but more importantly, I want to understand why you feel like um, you can't, we can't have a relationship. Um, you know, I assume you wouldn't be setting these limits unless you felt like it was the healthiest thing for you to do. Now, that statement's a way to get on the same page as your child. Your main task is to get them to not be defensive. So in saying something like that, it's a way of encouraging them to to kind of, you know, not feel so defensive. But then you can follow it up with, um, you know, I, I am willing to respect your boundaries, but but more important, I want to uh, work on the relationship and understand why you need to put these boundaries in place. You know, is there a reason we can't do that in family therapy or the things you want me to work on in my own therapy or the things that you feel like we should talk about? So in other words, you know, you can you may even end up accepting the boundary, but you, you want to have some kind of a pushback in there to kind of keep the conversation going. OK, thank you. Um, excellent that you answered that. That's a commonly asked question. I know. The next question, it's somebody wrote a very long statement here, but I'm going to ask the question that's in the very beginning. Sure. Is there any data on if girls stay estranged longer than sons? Statistically, sons are more at risk for estrangement uh, than daughters. Mothers in general are less vulnerable to estrangement than fathers. Fathers, something like 26% of fathers become estranged, uh, mothers, depending on who you read, between 7 and 11% uh, become estranged. So sons in general uh, are more likely to be estranged more from moms than dads. Okay. Do you have the, the percentage for the sons? Um, well, I don't have the percentage directly. I know that dads are just more at risk of being estranged from daughters. Uh, than they are their sons. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next question. Is it normal that for the therapist to listen to one side of the story and guide without listening to the story from the other part involved to the scenario? Well, it's not only normal. I mean, it's common. Um, I mean, in some ways, you know, as a therapist, we don't usually have both sides of the story so we kind of have to make inferences about what that person is or who they are what they're doing um, i don't think therapists have any business diagnosing a parent who's not uh, in the room and i think parents should be i mean therapists should be incredibly cautious if they're diagnosing because once people have a diagnosis, there's enormous social authority that comes from that. And it also suggests that the person is kind of just beyond repair. You know, if a therapist says, well, your mother is a, is a narcissist uh, or, you know, your dad's a borderline or a sociopath or whatever, it makes it seem like that person is, is completely helpless and hopeless. Um, I wrote an article recently with a psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins called uh, uh, narcissistic mother is the newest form of mommy shaming because, you know, narcissistic mother, it's like, it seems like just about every letter I get from an estranged or alienated kid to a mother says that, you know, you're a narcissist or my therapist thinks that you're a narcissist, etc. So in general, most therapists don't get both sides of the story, which, you know, on the one hand, isn't a problem. It's only a problem when therapists become too too aggressive or confident in their diagnoses and aren't really thinking about the well-being of the other parent who's not in the room. Thank you. I like that um, article. Where can we get that? Narcissistic mothers are the new form of mommy shaming, is it? Um, yeah, I published it on my private Facebook group. Um, if you're, uh, it was also in my newsletter. I don't yet have it on my website. You can Google it. Um, but it's clinical psychiatry, and I think they've got a, they don't have a paywall, but you have to register to get it. So um, if, if you like, Cindy, if people are interested, let me know, and I can send it to you, and you can distribute it if you like. Okay, fair enough. Everybody, if you, need, if you would like to get that, just write to me, and I um, will get it from Dr. Coleman. 
So the next question, I want to know if we have any legal rights to go after the therapist or for the purpose of raising awareness to fight this. We wrote our therapist up to the state and they said she didn't break any laws. It's very, very hard. Therapists have to, you know, they have to molest a kid or they have to like have sex with their clients or, you know, I mean, it's very hard to get somebody de-licensed. Um, you know, or even even punished. Um, I, I do know a psychiatrist who's work. He's an alienated psychiatrist who's working, trying to get um, some standards passed so that so that psychiatrists aren't able to uh, diagnose the person who's not in the room. But uh, I don't know if there's been much progress on that. But there should be. It's a big problem. I absolutely agree with that. Next question. Alienated mom of 15 year old son without contact for seven months. What can I do to make reunification sessions more productive? My son does not make eye contact and shows contempt for me during sessions. Yeah, well, I, my general rule of thumb with kids who've been alienated is that you want to think of yourself as the lighthouse that's on the beach and you're just steadily broadcasting light. You're always there. You're solid. You're rooted to the ground. Uh, while your kid is out at sea being pushed up and down by the waves of alienation. And sometimes they're going to surface and see you there, you know, broadcasting love and compassion and steadiness and interest. You're not going anywhere. You know, we know from Amy Baker's research of adult children who are alienated that uh, many of them wish that their parents hadn't given up. So particularly with a minor, uh, you just want to be consistent and loving. Um, um, you don't want to act too victimized, which is really hard. I think for mothers, you know, in a family therapy session, it's very tempted for them to feel really hurt and upset and cry or whatever. But, you know, your kid, your, your kid's a victim of the alienating parent. He doesn't, he has no clue what uh, what is going on, why he has the feelings towards you that he does. He doesn't know that he's been brainwashed into contempt um, of you. So you sort of you want to just kind of sit there, be be the adult in the room, you know, uh, being loving, compassionate, interested, assume, assume that, you know, there's some kernel uh, of truth. Try to ask him lots of questions. Uh, try to have some kind of a sense of humor about it to show that you're not too uh, undone by it. I think that I think that a lot of the times this kind of work is more about the music than the lyrics, meaning it's more about your your kind of attitude and who you're sort of representing yourself to be towards the child. Thank you. This next one, um, parent in, in therapy with minor children. I'm in a reunification process that is empowering the children as adults. Their therapists seem to support that in a way that I, as the out parent, am responding to their thoughts, comments as authentic, despite facts. I am not even allowed to present facts that dispute what the kids are reporting. I don't want to agree to apologize for things that didn't happen. What do you suggest? Yeah, well, that's common. Yeah, you don't really want to argue with them about it, um, which is, I know, a, a challenge, particularly if you feel like you're... Uh, being told, accused of things you know that you didn't do, that you know were coached by the uh, alienating parent. So, um, so again, you're you're you're. It's often more about the music than the lyrics. What you're trying to do is represent yourself as a loving, credible, steady, not defensive person. So, like, let's say your kid says, "Well, Dad, you were always so." Um, I think was this a father, Cindy? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, okay. You know, Dad, you were always so so aggressive all the time and yelling at us and whatever. And, you know, your dad could say, oh, gosh, was I? I don't, you know, was I really? Did I, did I yell that much? But, um, wow, I didn't realize that. I'm sorry. And You have any, any memories, you know, in particular of that happening? But, again, not to disprove them. The goal, you're not going to, it's not a court of law. And if it is, you're already guilty until proven innocent. So your goal isn't to... It, Again, it's more about the music than the lyrics, meaning that your your task is to show yourself as being dedicated, willing to hear whatever accusation there is, no matter how far-fetched. You know, you could say something like, 
gosh, I don't really remember it. Like, like let's say it's some completely, you know, invented memory. Gosh, I don't really remember that. I guess that's possible. It doesn't really sound like me, but wow, man, if I said that, yeah, I could see why you'd be pissed off. I'd be pissed off too. I'm sorry. So can you hear in that it's a lot about the music, meaning, you know, the dad's been kind of good natured, affectionate, not flippant, but kind of going like, wow, did I really, did I really say that? God, I don't, I don't remember that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I could see why you'd be, be mad about it. Well, well, will you promise me that if I, next time I do that, tell me, because clearly, clearly I've got some blind spots here. Now, that kind of approach can be, you know, difficult for parents to take because they already feel like their lives with their children are already being ruined by the alienating parent. Um, so it's hard for them to embrace any shred of the possibility that their child may be, you know, that they're validating the problem. The, the, the problem is you have to go toward the memory rather than away from it. Anything that sounds defensive loses your audience. Anything that sounds kind of interested and willing to take a look at it and open to, to being corrected um, is a way to do that. So, so what I'm modeling here is a way to hold on to your own reality. You don't have to say, yeah, you're right. I was a terrible parent. I could see why you don't want to spend time with me or be in therapy with me or come to my house, you know, or have me at your wedding or your, you know, graduation or whatever. No, you're saying something like, well, gosh, I wish, I guess I've got some pretty big blind spots that I wasn't aware that was going on. So they're sort of blaming you. You're taking it in and you're taking it on. You don't, don't feel, don't, when I say take it in, I don't mean don't, not to feel bad about yourself, but you're kind of going, oh, well, let, let's take a look at that together. Not to prove them wrong, but to get them to lower their defenses. The more their defenses up are up, game over. As soon as their defenses come down, now they can look at you differently. Now, one of the reasons that some of these alienated kids um, maintain their memories, because parents will often say to me, well, don't they remember all the good times we had together? I mean, you know, parents will bring in pictures of them, you know, doing these incredible things. They'll bring in cards, best mom ever, best dad ever. It was like a year ago. And now because of therapy or because of divorce and alienation, et cetera, now they're being said, worst parent ever. You were a crappy father, mother, you're a narcissist, et cetera. And parents often feel like, well, where did all those good memories go? Where did my, those huge investment I made in my children's well-being disappear to? Well, they're in there, but they're not going to get access to them if you're being defensive. I mean, they may through the process of maturation, growth, etc. But they're more likely to get there if you kind of go, gosh, really? Did that, did that happen like that? Wow. I could see why you'd be upset. I don't, I don't remember that, but you know what? I could be wrong. Now, I don't think parents should do that if they're being accused of molesting their children. I just think that's too big of an accusation uh, for parents to to accept. I think when that's the case, I mean, obviously, assuming that they really didn't molest their children, they should say something like, uh, well, sweetheart, I can tell you with 100 percent of 30 that that didn't happen uh, because I'm not capable of molesting any child especially my own. But then you have to pivot back to the reality and say something like, but I know that sometimes people remember things a certain way because of other things in the relationship that didn't feel good. Uh, so I'm certainly not trying to shut the conversation down. And if you'd like to meet with me, with the therapist who specializes in this, I'm more than happy to do it. I'm more than happy to undergo a psychological evaluation. The problem is a lot of kids who have these false memories don't want to do any of that because they they like the having the 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 idea that they were traumatized because of the explanatory power that it has, meaning that the it allows them to say, well, this is the reasons I have the problems that I have. It's what I was talking about um, earlier. Thank you. Next question. Estranged son has depression, failure to launch, and working with the schema therapist. Maladaptive attachment is core theory. Now my husband has left me and is aligned with her son, so I feel like I'm living in a reality distortion. What more can I do? I have so much contempt for all these theories, maladaptive attachment. First of all, um, you know, the research, recent research on attachment shows that there has been a general decline uh, in attachment uh, in younger people, but it's not because of bad parenting. It's because of all these social forces, A. B, uh, a child's capacity to attach also, you know, 
Well, yeah, it may be that it's because the parent was too disorganized psychologically, but it may also be that the child came into the world with an avoidant detachment, an attachment perspective because they were, they came into the world highly anxious, uh, you know, overstimul easily overstimulated, uh, highly sensitive, etc. There's many reasons that a child might have issues around attachment that don't have to do with the parent. But again, once you're accused of something, you can't just say, no, that's full of crap. Your therapist needs to read this, you know, this, this research. They don't know what they're talking about. You know, you still have to go toward it. You still have to, it's like what I was saying to say, if you're accused of being a narcissist, you say something like, well, um, I, gee, I wasn't aware that you were that way, but I'm, I'm really sad to hear that. Is there something that you'd like me to read? Do you want to go do some therapy around it? Is there things that you'd like me to work on? Do you want to have a conversation about how you think you were impacted by that? Again, you're going toward the complaint, not away from it. You're showing yourself as somebody who's willing to work on yourself, to do due diligence, to communicate in this modern psychological, growth-centered, egalitarian way and that will work in your favor. Now, again, nothing I can say or any, any other person can say is going to guarantee any of these things work. That's the tragedy of estrangement and alienation. Sometimes the forces that are on the other side of the parent are stronger than any parent or any advocate for that parent. But these are the things that have the best chance of working from my perspective. Okay, the last question. Um, how do you predict this epidemic of estrangement alienation will play out on the current children and grandkids? Will it take our adult kids to feel the same pain for them to understand? Yeah, I'm sort of contemplating writing an article that's something with, with a title, something like, you know, millennials and Gen Z, your children are coming for you with estrangement too. Because so many of these kids are so self-righteous about uh, their own uh, behavior like, well, you should have done X or Y, and you should have known this as a parent, and you did this, so I don't owe you anything. And they don't realize that estrangement has become part of the culture. So a lot of these, you know, uh, millennials and Gen Z kids are going to have their own kids. And unless there's a radical change in our culture, which I do not foresee, to me, it's getting, we're getting more and more atomized, more and more individualistic. A lot of them are going to start to get uh, estranged as well. So maybe once that starts to happen, we'll see some kind of a turn in the culture, but I don't see it. I don't see it happening anywhere in the near future because of that. Yeah. Very good point because they're modeling to their children. It's a, it's not important to have a relationship with parents, right? What are they teaching? So excellent. Well, exactly. well, I, so I, thank you for that. I want to, you know, I can't say enough thanks. You're always welcome to come back. We haven't had you speak to our group in a really long time, but we're going to change that and have you more often. <laughs> so everybody knows where to get Dr. Coleman. Um, he does have those free little webinars. You can ask questions um, that he has at the beginning of the week. Get on his mailing list if you are not already on there. I've done mo much of that work myself. I have two estranged sons mm -hmm. that were alienated first. So with that, I'm going to say thank you. And for everybody else, if anybody um, has anything you'd like to say to Dr. Coleman, put your thank yous in the chat. We would greatly appreciate that. And then I'm going to close our call with a quote that I always um, like to put out there. And I mentioned earlier that we have a grief slash healing program. And if you're experiencing a lot of pain and suffering inside of not having access to your children, I'm going to invite you to think about this. I sat with my anger long enough until she told me her real name was grief. So if you're dealing with grief, work through it. It's normal and natural to go through the stages of grief. So with that, keep up the great work. You're all the ones doing the work. You're the ones who are here and um, continue. We hope you'll continue to join ISNAF follow Dr. Coleman, and several people commented in the uh, comments um, that your book is on Audible, and uh, it's an excellent book, and they found it as a great resource. So highly recommend, if you don't have it, go and get the book as well, and you can have more of Dr. Coleman.